So today we will be taking the, it's called the Ambalatika Rahava Sutta. This is Sutta number 61 in the Majjhima beginning on page 523. Okay, and this is the meaning of the Sutta is the advice to Rahula at a place called Ambalatika. Okay, who who is Rahula? <laughs> Anybody know? Anybody doesn't know? So Rahula was the Buddha's own physical son. And when the Buddha was still a prince living in the palace, then he was married according to the tradition, at the age of 16. And somehow he and his wife didn't have any children until just when he was 29 years old, so for 13 years. And then just when he was going through this process of reflection of the unsatisfactory nature of life and pondering whether he should leave the worldly life in order to become an ascetic, his wife conceived, and then over time, she, the pregnancy increased until, according to tradition, I don't know whether this is a real fact or not, <laughs> but just when he made up his mind to renounce the worldly life, she gave birth to the child. And then it said that he gave the child the name Rahla with the meaning of fetter or bond because the idea is that having given birth to a child, now this little child is acting as a bond on him, a kind of bond or fetter of the heart, compelling him or pressuring him to remain in the, in the worldly life and not to renounce. I don't really know how the word Rahula gets the meaning of fetter, since it seems to be based on the word, the name Rahu, which is supposed to be a kind of demon that swallows up the moon. Maybe it was the ancient Indian way of representing the lunar eclipse. So anyway, the tradition explains the name Rahu to mean fetter. And yet the Buddha made the decision, even though his wife had just given birth to this baby, he made the decision to leave the household life. And according, again, according to tradition, on the very night that he decided to renounce, when his wife and the newborn baby were lying in the bed, in the middle of the night, he got up and he went to the door of their chamber, the bed chamber, and he opened the door and then he looked back one final time that his wife and child sleeping on the bed. Perhaps his heart was torn with indecision. Should I go back? Should I leave? Should I go back? Should I leave? But then he decided to leave and rest his history. <laughs> but then after his, his quest for enlightenment took six years, and then shortly after his enlightenment, when he began, began to teach, as his reputation spread, the Sakyans heard that their own offspring, the prince Siddhartha, 
has now become the famous teacher known as the Buddha. And so they invited him to come back to the capital of the Sakyan Republic, Kapilavattu. And so the Buddha came back and visited the city. And as he was walking down the street, together with the community of monks, his former wife and the child were looking out the window of the palace. And then his wife point, pointed him out to Rahula and said, Rahula, do you know who that is? And Rahula said, no, I don't. Then the wife said, that is your father. <laughs> and then she said to Rahula, go to him and ask him for your inheritance. Maybe she had in mind to receive, you know, the wealth of the kingdom. Oh, it wasn't the kingdom, it was a republic, but the wealth of their aristocratic family. And so Rahula went up to the Buddha and said, Father, please give me my inheritance. Then the Buddha paused and thought, should I give him a worldly inheritance, just wealth that will just eventually decay and vanish? Or should I give him the deathless inheritance, the past and nirvana? And so then the Buddha turned to Sariputta and said, ordain him. <laughs> and so the Buddha's disciple Sariputta ordained Rahula, and in this way Rahula became, at the age of seven, became a novice monk. Okay, and so when this sutta opens, apparently Rahula is still a little boy, still just a young novice. And so here the Buddha wants to give Rahula a little lesson and a basic ethical point. Perhaps it was the case that Rahula, as a little boy, thought that it would be, like, there's a habit with little boys, that it would be fun to speak falsehoods, to tell lies, to mislead people, in order to be able to laugh at them when they believed his lies. Okay, so Rahula, uh, the Buddha, goes to Rahula while he's living at this grove, probably very close to the bamboo grove. And then Rahula prepares a seat for him, and so on, and then pays homage to him, and sits down. And now the Buddha, very, very skillfully, is going to use a practical device, a practical method to teach, to, to teach Rahula the lesson that he wants to impart to him. And the point of his lesson is going to be the importance of maintaining truthful speech. Okay, so Rahula sets up some water for the Buddha to wash his feet. So the Buddha washes his feet, and then he leaves a little bit of water in the vessel. Then he asked Rahula, do you see this little bit of water left in the vessel? And Rahula says, yes. Then the Buddha says, even so, <coughs> even so little, Rahula, is the reckless, a little difficult to understand here, is the recluseship of those who are not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie. What's meant by recluseship here, you would say, is, maybe we could put it more freely, the value of the spiritual life for one who is not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie. But since Rahula is now a little ascetic, a little renunciant, so the Buddha phrases his point in terms of recluseship. Okay, so there's a little water left in the vessel, and in the same way, one who is not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie has just a little bit of spirituality left in him. Okay, then the Buddha throws away the little bit of water that was left, 
and says, do you see how that little bit of water was thrown away? And Rahula says, yes. So then the Buddha says, in the same way, in just that way, the recluseship or spirituality has been thrown away of those who are not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie. Okay, then the third example, the Buddha turns the water vessel upside down and says, do you see how this vessel has been turned upside down? And then Rahula says, yes. And the Buddha says, in the same way, those who are not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie have turned their recluseship or their spiritual life upside down. Okay, then the fourth step, the Buddha turns the vessel upright again and then points out to Rahula that the water vessel is now empty. And then the Buddha makes the point that in the same way, the spirituality or recluseship of those who are not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie becomes hollow and empty. Okay, so these are four, four similes, all based on the example of the water vessel that the Buddha uses to convey to Rahula the importance of speaking the truth. Okay, now the Buddha gives another simile, and this one is a little bit problematic. This is in, I'm in paragraph 7 now. The Buddha says, suppose there were a royal tusker elephant with tusks, long tusks. It's a very powerful elephant that's used in battle. And so in battle, it would perform its task with its forefeet, with its hind feet, with its forequarters, hind quarters, with its head and its ears, with its tusks and its tail. Yet he would keep back his trunk. Okay, in this case, his rider would think that the elephant, the royal tusker elephant, even though he's willing to exert himself in battle, yet he's still holding back. He's not yet really fully surrendered himself to his task. But when that elephant performs his task with every part of his body, even with his trunk, then the rider would think that now this tusker elephant is even ready to give up his life for the sake of battle, for winning the battle. Now there is nothing that this royal tusker elephant would not do. And so then the Buddha now draws out the point of the simile. So too, Rahula, when one is not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie, there is no evil, I say, that one would not do. Therefore, you should train Thus, I will not utter a falsehood, even as a joke. Okay, the reason why I say that this last simile is a little bit problematic, maybe does anybody have, else have any idea of why I say that it's problematic? The elephant is ready to sacrifice everything for the sake of the battle. What do we usually, what would the king think of that elephant or the rider? I would think of a liar as one who just uses part of himself, that the, the elephant is using all of himself. It doesn't suggest something. Yeah, I mean, that's so, but maybe it's not exactly what I was thinking of. You were thinking it endangered the, the one driving car? Is that? No, um, 
It's really not, it's pretty simple. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the point. Yeah, if the elephant is ready to sacrifice himself, even to you, to use his trunk in the battle, then one would evaluate that as a really worthy, admirable elephant. <laughs> Whereas somebody is willing to speak a, de a deliberate falsehood, but or somebody is not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie, then we would uh, rate that person negatively. So that's why I say it seems a little bit strange. Yeah, please. When you read it, I, I took the other name. I thought withholding the trunk meant withholding the truth. That you, you're still holding on to some form of, of ego selfishness. And, mm -hmm. You know, I saw it the, the, the way that I explained, and the way that this gentleman in the back saw it. I saw it as a, a sense of restraint, and then by withholding the trunk, you maintain some sort of self awareness, and then yeah. you let it go, you sort of lose all sense of control. Yeah, maybe, that's, maybe that is the way in which the simile works. But there still seems to be a little bit of a tension here, since, at least the way I see it, that from the standpoint of the military, or the king, or the general in charge of the army, the elephant that's willing to, um, even to use its trunk, doesn't spare any part of its body, would be considered admirable, the best elephant for, for, to use in battle. Whereas the person who is willing to tell a deliberate lie, not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie, is one that we would rate negative. Yeah, I want to go over some of the points that come out from Buddhist texts and also from my own reflection on the importance of telling the truth. First, I think it's, even though this text is speaking solely about avoiding speaking falsehood, about not telling a deliberate lie, but other texts analyze telling, speaking falsehood in terms of the motivation. Maybe the classical text that's repeated in many suttas on speaking falsehood, we find an example of it in sutta number 41. This is on page 380. In paragraph 9, which begins at the end of the, at, at the bottom of the page, here the Buddha is explaining four kinds of verbal conduct that are not in accordance with the Dhamma, unrighteous conduct. And the first of these is speaking falsehood. So the example given is that when one is summoned to a court or to a meeting to his relative's presence, or to his guild, or to the royal family's presence, and questioned as a witness thus, tell what you know, not knowing, he says, I know, or knowing, he says, I do not know, not seeing, he says, I see, or say, seeing, he says, I do not see. In full awareness, he speaks falsehood for his own ends, or for another's ends, or for some trifling, worldly end. And so it seems in the suttas which single out false speech, or the suttas which are defining false speech as a type of unrighteous conduct, what is singled out for special mention is the falsehood which takes place when one bears false witness. 
that is, when one is committing, in effect, what is perjury. And the reason why one is speaking falsehood in this, according to this passage, one is doing so for one's own ends or for another's ends. Those are the two main reasons. One is doing so to secure some benefit for oneself or some benefit for somebody else, maybe somebody who is close to you, like a relative or friend. And then what's added is for some trifling, worldly end. I don't know what specifically could be intended by that. But anyway, this is, in the suttas, the type, the classical description of false speech. Other texts give, explain the different motivations that lie behind false speech. And these are usually given in terms of the three unwholesome roots. So there can be false speech, which is motivated by greed. This is when one speaks falsehood to gain some benefit for oneself or for those who are close to oneself. To gain wealth, position, respect, admiration, praise, so on. Okay, then there is false speech which originates from hatred or ill will. This is where one tells a malicious lie. That is when one lies in order to hurt others, to damage others, maybe to ruin the good standing, good reputation of others, to break up friendships, or to embarrass or humiliate others. And then the third motivation for lying is delusion. And this might, I'm just trying to think of some examples of delusion. One might be the irrational lie, I irrational lie. Somebody who doesn't really have a very clear reason for lying, but just becomes a habitual or compulsive liar. You know, there are some people who just feel a constant compulsion to lie, even though there's no clear driving motivation for the lie. It just becomes a habitual way of life with them. And then another type of lie arising from delusion. I don't know, other examples don't come to mind. Anybody else have any, any ideas? What could be it? Please. Well, I don't have an idea about that, but I, I wonder how it meshes with compassion. Some Somebody says, oh, my granddaughter said recently, I'm the smartest. And I thought, well, you're not really the smartest. Yeah. I, I don't know. Or, yeah. I'm ugly. You don't want to say, yeah, you're ugly. <laughs> you know, so I wonder how compassion blends in with some kind of. Yeah, this is actually something that I, I plan to, to come into. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's okay, but. That's something I was going to get to get to. But just to take some examples of what might be considered lies springing from delusion. Go. Yeah. Yeah, though in this, in this case, I would say that the government knows the truth. It could be lying in order to delude people. For their own good. It could be for, for the people's own good. As it were, yeah, pretty close about that, but yeah. Then we come to this point that Dina just raised about lying 
which might be motivated by compassion, which is a point that I want to come to. I'm trying to think of more examples of lies that might, might be motivated by delusion. People do persuade themselves that a lie is the truth. Yeah. I once dated the son of a general who said that his father persuaded himself that it was absolutely true that we had to fight in Vietnam. Mm. That, that we crossed the line from a deliberate lie to actually believing the lie is the truth. Yeah, that is a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I had that under a different heading that I wanted to cover in speaking about falsehood and obligation to speak the truth. Yeah, I wanted to do to sort of explore some of the reasons that underlie the stricture against lying. Okay. I just came up with a few reasons. Maybe in discussion we could add some more. One is that lying is disruptive of social cohesion. Like in order for a, any kind of social unit to hold together harmoniously and to avoid disruption, what's necessary is for people to have trust in one another. And so, as long as we can have some confidence that in our communications we are speaking, we are hearing the truth from others, and as long as others have, could have some confidence that they are hearing the truth from us, then we have reasons for cooperating, collaborating, and holding together into a harmonious and successfully functioning society. But when people start to speak falsehood, well, first at the individual level, if one sees that a person is repeatedly speaking falsehood, then how do you relate to that person? What's, what's the natural reaction when that, that person tells you something, something important? But you don't trust them, yeah. And now if this spreads throughout the society, then the kind of trust that serves as the glue or cement that holds society together, that gets shattered and we fall into a state of kind of survival of the fittest where we're willing to use any kind of deception, falsehood, lies in order to advance ourselves or those that we um, that are dear to us and to harm and injure others. And for this reason, I would say that responsibility for <laughs> speaking the truth falls most heavily upon those in positions of authority. <laughs> authority. <laughs> and so when those in positions of power and authority are known to speak falsehood, then the sense of trust breaks down to the whole social order and the feeling spreads that if they're entitled to, to lie, I too can tell a lie. Since, I mean, if they're so important in such powerful positions, and they're telling lies, then a small fry like myself, if I tell lies, it does, it's not really so significant. And so I think well, this is almost a situation that we're coming to in this country now when we find out that, especially the way major corporations spread falsehoods. You know, I remember years ago when reports were coming out about the connection between cigarette smoking and lung cancer and heart disease. The tobacco companies tried to hide all of the evidence and to spread falsehood that there's no connection, that there's just chance connection between smoking and lung cancer. And now it's the connection between carbon emissions and global warming. You know, powerful petroleum corporations, coal corporations, you know, they try to cover up all of the evidence to they set up their own 
quote, research councils, their own websites, to spread the misleading or disinformation, trying to throw question marks around the connection between carbon, carbon emissions and global warming. Okay, so that's the, in corporations and in politics also, we find that you know, it's very difficult to find politicians who are people of real integrity, who don't flip-flop, change their positions in order to suit the mood of the, the people that they're trying to, to win over. And so in order to restore social, social harmony, it's important to find people, real people of real integrity, who are willing to speak the truth and to hold to the truth, even when it means going against powerful vested interests, when it means going against popular opinion. Okay, so one reason for the stricture against lying is that it's necessary to preserve mutual trust between people, and in this way to protect social harmony. Another reason, on a more personal level, is that lies tend to proliferate. Like if one tells <laughs> one lie, then sometimes one could get away with it. But if somebody suspects one of having to told a lie, and then challenges one, then in order to defend yourself and protect yourself, you have to tell another lie. And then in order to keep the story coherent, to keep that lie intact, then you have to tell still another lie, and then another lie, and another lie, until you become just completely enclosed in a web of lies. In my own personal experience, there was one incident that took place in my childhood that always remains quite clear in my memory. Um, <laughs> on a shop on, in 13th Avenue in Brooklyn, no, it was 12th Avenue, not so far from my, my family home, in the shop window, there was a set with a pen and a pencil, a pen and pencil set. And each time I would pass it, I would look at the pen and pencil set, and oh, it was just so enticing. I don't, I don't remember how old I was, maybe about eight years old. Barely knew how to write, but seeing the pen and pencil set, with these bright colors, it was a kind of paisley pattern of colors. And it was so attractive. And then I noticed that my mother <laughs> left her pocketbook on the counter in the kitchen. And I saw the price tag for the pen and pencil set. And one day I couldn't resist, when my mother was out or in another room, I couldn't resist opening the pocketbook and seeing that there was enough money <laughs> to buy the pen and pencil set. <laughs> and so at that time I wasn't <laughs> an ordained Buddhist monk with the precept not to speak full, not to steal. <laughs> but I was just a little boy, easily tempted. And so, looking around, <laughs> mom's in the other room, out comes the five dollar bill, or could be two dollars, I don't remember. Into the pocket. And then later that day, I'm off to the corner shop to buy the pen and pencil set and bring it back. But then my parents saw the pen and pencil set and asked me, where did you get the money to buy the pen and pencil set? I think I might have told them, I don't remember the exact reason, but hypothetically I might have said, 
grandma gave it, gave me the money, which was a bit foolish because <laughs> grandma was living just upstairs. <laughs> So I think it could have been that evening, and mom and dad sitting <laughs> with a rather stern expression on their face. You just like the Buddha calling Ravala, <laughs> called me in and said, Jeffrey, sit down, we want to speak to you. <laughs> you said you got the money to buy that pen and pencil set from grandma, but we asked grandma and she said, she didn't give you give you any money. So where do you get the money from? So then shamefully I had to tell them the truth. And then they told me something that really stuck in my mind, stuck in my mind throughout my whole life. They said, stealing is bad. It's something you shouldn't do. But what you did after that is even worse. What you did was to tell a lie in order to cover up your bad act. And so, then they stressed me the importance of telling the truth. And so I've always remembered that. So, <laughs> unfortunately, in my teenage years, I would, <laughs> I would steal little things from shops. <laughs> but um, I probably told lies also, but it all, remained clearly in my mind that I should not tell a lie in order to cover up other bad acts. Okay, so the second reason for abstaining from lying is that lies come to proliferate until we find ourselves you know, locked in a cage of lies. The third reason is that over time, we come to believe our own lies. And so, we lose a sense of what's real and what's imaginary. You know, that division between the two breaks down. And so, I think this is the case of what happens with habitual liars. Somebody who tells lies, you know, boastfully in order to boost his own status, stories about his adventures in India and Africa, South America, when he never left Brooklyn. <laughs> but after a while, he comes to believe these. And so he maybe has like a swollen sense of ego, of self-importance, because he's been telling a lot of lies in order to boost his standing in the eyes of others. And so he gets swollen up and completely deceived, deceiving himself by his own falsehoods. And often we could almost well, we develop a certain sensitivity towards people like that. So when we come across people who are habitual liars, you know, maybe not immediately, but after a little while, we can tell that they're liars. And then we develop a distrust towards them. Okay, then there's another reason that I think the Buddha emphasizes so much, puts so much emphasis on truthful speech. And this is because what I say is a certain parallelism or correspondence between truthful speech and wisdom. Like the, the function of wisdom, according to the Buddha's teaching, is to see and know things as they really are. And the function of truthful speech is to communicate the way things really are. So if we are going to develop wisdom, the insight into the nature of things as they really are, then we have to build up a kind of subjective foundation for that by, in our speech, describing things as they really are. So we could say that wisdom and truthful speech are respectively the inner 
and outer manifestations of a commitment to reality. And when we make this commitment to truthful speech, this establishes a correspondence between our own inner being and the nature of reality or actuality. And so, by establishing that correspondence, then truthful speech contributes to the growth and development of wisdom. Okay, so these are some of the reasons why I would say that Buddhism places so much emphasis on truthful speech. But now a certain problem comes up. So this is some of the questions or comments earlier that were pointing in this direction. And that is, the question comes up, are there ever occasions when speaking falsehood is permissible or even necessary. And this is an interesting problem because, and this is my complaint against the suttas, that one doesn't find in the suttas, at least to my knowledge, examples brought up or cases brought up where there is a conflict of moral obligations, where there are two sort of moral obligations which in certain occasion, on certain occasions are not compatible. To give an example of this, different from that of truthful speech, say a farmer has taken the five precepts not to take life, and yet in order to plow his field, Inevitably, he's going to be harming, injuring living beings, the beings that live in the ground. So, one would think that a farmer who's taken the five precepts might have some inner struggle. How can I plow my field in order to grow food, to provide for my family, and to earn a living, and yet uphold the precept to avoid taking life? even though he's not sort of deliberately singling out creatures to kill, but he knows when he's plowing the field that creatures are going to be killed. And yet we don't see in the suttas examples where a farmer might come to the Buddha and present him with that moral dilemma. And similarly, there are cases where there seems to be a conflict between the obligation to speak the truth and some other moral obligation to take maybe the a very clear clear case during the period when in when the Nazis came to power in Germany and the years of World War II there were families in some of the country, well, in Germany itself, in some of the other countries conquered by the Nazis, in Poland, Czechoslovakia, Holland, which would hide Jewish people, you know, in special rooms that they would build, and attics, and basements, and keep them there. And when, sometimes I guess the Nazi inspectors would come around checking to see if there are any Jews and they would have to ask the family, have you seen or do you know of the presence of any Jewish people around here? Okay, if the families which are protecting the Jewish people speak the truth, say we have to speak the truth, and say yes, there are some Jewish people in our basement or in the attic, then they know that's the end of them. They'll be gathered, sent off to the concentration camp, and most likely obliterated. And so here, there's a conflict of ethical obligations, and it seems almost overwhelmingly certain that the obligation to protect the lives of others has a greater claim on our allegiance, in that case, than the obligation to speak the truth. Shake your head this way. 
maybe I'm a bad liar. I <laughs> say I saw Bruce a couple of days ago. I do not see them now. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely true, deceiving. Yes, I saw them a couple of days ago, but I'm not seeing them as of now. <laughs> One day from now on, you will you will not believe me. <laughs> What is that? <laughs> I'm deceiving them with a good heart, but I am not telling lie at all. You're going to come and clean up my room after a class? <laughs> I have, yes. to keep, have to keep an eye on you. <laughs> Watch your wallet. <laughs> Yeah, the question could be phrased in a way that wouldn't allow you to. Uh, so, what the situation allow you to protect you, Nari, to buy also have a wisdom way to, to you know, protect others? That is the key. That's what I feel sometimes. How we solve that in a certain situation? Yeah. Some kind of conflict. Conflict, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Should I follow the sutra or should I do something? How am I to this one to become the wisdom? I have a problem with that. Yeah. And will this kind of wisdom be accepted by this reality we live or by the sutra of time we live? I'm finding that the hard part. Yeah, yeah. And then for me, I think some people have some comments to comment on your comment. Yeah, please. Yes. I feel like right now our discussion is to look at, we use a microscope to look at detail. We use the what? The microscope to look at detail, yeah. And then magnify to look at detail. Yeah. If we state that, we see the whole, the whole situation. Yeah. Before I say, yeah, I do not see these people. I do not. I do not see these people. I yeah. say people. I say Jewish. And I prevent these people, kill people. Yeah. It's good deed. It's it's good deed. Yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really. I I don't think it's violate anything. Yeah. Maybe sacrifice myself. Yeah. I'll say more than more. Yeah. 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 Okay. First, then we take um, Andrea, Treya, and then oh, I see you have it. Okay, so David, you speak. It's it's really the intent. I think that's extremely important. I think that's extremely important point. Yes, yeah. the doctor, and then yeah. I'm going to die. The doctor wants to protect you for some yeah. period of time for some good reason. Yeah. You know, I feel fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big yeah. kind of a lie. Yeah, and I think that's where yeah. com- compassion, as Dean of Ordo before, comes in. I say that there are, even though the texts speak about how lies are motivated by greed, hatred, or delusion. But it seems to me that in some cases there are lies which are motivated by compassion. And I don't think somebody can argue that, well, if you say that compa- that there are compassionate grounds for lying, then you're encouraging the unrestrained multiplication of falsehood. I don't think that's the case. It's not very convincing to me. This also a situation where the person doesn't realize that they're lying. You know, uh, you, you know that the story about the sky is falling. Well, that's, I would say that that's not really a lie. That's one is saying something which is not true, but it, I say that lying implies intention. If there's no intention to communicate something falsely, it's not a lie. 
and then try out for the command. I personally feel if one has any sort of moral backbone, one knows what is right and what is wrong. It's rather simple. You protect the person hiding from the Nazis. You protect the runaway slave in the underground yeah. railroad. Yeah. Or there are many other sorts of situations. Yeah. And to go through, well, I'm not really lying, so of course it's sort of more of a quick patient. To go through. To say, well, if I say this, yeah. it's not yeah. really a guy. It's yeah. the worst form of moral quick yeah. 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 And it's a form of false scrupulosity. Yeah. Which really, um, So basically, I, I come in agreement with that. There are instances where one gets a very clear, well, intuitive, moral sense of what is right and what is wrong. Um, I say also that there are some people who have a professional commitment to speak falsehood, and speaking falsehood is necessary to protect large numbers of people. People working in, well, <laughs> maybe I'll get some eggs thrown at me, but somebody working in the CIA. <laughs> you, you do have to be killed. Excuse me? You do have to be killed. Yeah, exactly, and you have to put out like a false identity. Like a yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's not always with that with bad, bad intentions. So. Anyway, so. I just wanted to bring out that there are cases where it seems that there are other moral obligations sort of trump the obligation to speak the truth. So what I would say is that other things being equal, if there is no overriding, no other overriding moral obligation, then we're under an obligation to speak the truth. Yeah. Because it doesn't, it's possible wait, 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 wait. Take the microphone. I, you mentioned that this was a place where this is a point that you had, where you had a problem with the sutra. Yeah. Because it doesn't mention these things. But conceivably, you, you could have problems anywhere along the line with the, with the sutras. And how do you know when, the, when, when to believe it and accept it and, and when to question it? Mm. I mean, that's a big question that maybe I shouldn't try to go into right now. <laughs> Are some of the comments now answer your, the point that you brought up? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't want to get in, into such a big question, but just to keep it focused on the question of whether there's a, co a conflict of moral obligations. And here, I think one has to have what I would call an intuitive rel reliance upon one's own intuition about what is right, what is wrong, in, in certain under the circumstances in which one finds oneself. Like the farmer who has to plow the field in order to grow crops and feed his family, 
I mean, he'll understand that these are sort of like the limitations placed on him, that he can't abstain from taking life perfectly, a hundred percent, but he does his best. Okay, now I want to go back to the sutta. Okay, then just taking the last the last sentence in paragraph seven, or the next to last sentence. The Buddha says to Ramla, when one is not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie, I, there is no evil I say that one would not do. Again, this seems like a strong statement. And I would suppose that the Buddha is making a statement like that under particular circumstances that we, we don't fully know because they're part of the context under which the sutta was given. I don't know whether that can be taken as, you know, just point blank as a generalization that we should always adhere to. In fact, there's an interesting case in the Angli Mala Sutta. This is Sutta number 86 in the Majjhima Nikaya. This is on page 714 in the Middle Length Discourses. Probably many of you know the story of Anguli Mala. In his, er, the earlier part of his life, he had been a terrible, what we call a serial killer, who would kill many, many people, and whenever he would kill them, he would cut off one of their fingers, dry it up, till only the bone remains, and then he put together a necklace of the bones of their fingers. And so he was the most feared serial killer in this part of North India. But the Buddha went into the forest where he was living, transformed him, and then Angulimala became a Buddhist monk, and then <clears throat> he became very well-disciplined, very admirable monk. Eventually, he reached Arhatship. Okay, now one day, Angulimala was going on arms round in the town of Sabati, and then he saw a woman who was giving, he was having a, a difficult childbirth. And then the Angulimala returned to the Buddha and reported what he saw. And then this is in paragraph 15, the Buddha says to Anguli Mala, he says, in that case, go into Savati and say to that woman, <coughs> Sister, since <coughs> I was born, I do not recall that I have ever intentionally deprived a living being of life. By this truth, may you be well, and may your infant be well. Then Anguli Mala says to the Buddha, he says, Bhante, in that case, wouldn't I be telling a deliberate lie? For I have intentionally killed many living beings. But then the Buddha said, you see, the Buddha had a different intention in mind when he said that, which wasn't made explicit. And so the way Anguli Mala understood it, if he were to say, say that, make that statement, he would be telling a deliberate lie. And so the Buddha then expresses his intention explicitly. He says, then go into Savati and say to that woman, Sister, since I was born with a noble birth, I do not recall that I have ever deprived, intentionally deprived a living being of life. By this truth, may you be well, and may your infant be well. Then Angulimala goes into the city, he goes up to the woman, he makes that statement, and then the woman has an easy childbirth, and the infant is well, and the woman becomes well. I think this was before, at least according to the sutta, before Angulimala became an arhat, but perhaps already he was a sotapanna, 
So he was a noble monk. Okay, so now we move to the next part of the sutta, which introduces a shift in emphasis just from speech to all aspects of one's conduct, and it places the emphasis on reflecting before acting. And again, the Buddha uses an analogy to convey his point. He speaks about using a mirror. So he asks Rahula, what is the purpose of a mirror? And Rahula uses, replies, it's for the purpose of reflection. And just conveniently, in both Pali and in English, the word reflection can have two meanings. One is the meaning of you know, something <clears throat> a visible impression gets bounced back from another surface, and in thought, one considers something, contemplates it before acting upon it. Okay, so Rahula says the mirror is used for the purpose of reflection, and so the Buddha then says, in the same way, Rahula, an action with the body should be done after repeated reflection. Verbal, an action of speech, should be done after repeated reflection. An action in mind should be done after repeated reflection. Okay, then the Buddha is going to extend this kind of reflection. In this first paragraph, he just applies it to the present. When one is about to act, by body, speech, or thought, one reflects on that action before acting. Now the Buddha is going to extend that process of reflection to the three periods of time. So in paragraph 9 he says, when you wish to do an action with the body, you should reflect upon that same bodily action thus. And now he's going to show exactly how one refle reflects on it. Would this action that I want to do with the body lead to my own affliction, my own harm, to the harm of others or to the harm of both of us? Is it an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, painful results? Okay, when you reflect, if you know that the action is going to be harmful to yourself, to others, to both, <clears throat> that it's an unwholesome bodily action that will bring painful results, then you definitely should not do that action with the body. But when you reflect, if you know that the action won't have any harmful effects on oneself or others, then you can do that action with the body. Okay, so that is the way that one reflects before engaging in the action. But now, in paragraph 10, the Buddha explains how one reflects as one is engaging in the action. So while you are doing an action with the body, this is if a little boy back in Brooklyn, 52nd Street in Brooklyn, as he was pulling out the five dollars from his mother's pocketbook. Okay, while you are doing an action with the body, you should reflect upon that same bodily action thus. Okay, one reflects upon it in the same way. And then, if you realize that it's going to be harmful to oneself or others, then you should suspend such a bodily action. Then one stops in the process. As one is doing it, one stops and sort of short circuits the action before completing it. But when you reflect, if you know that this action won't have any, bring any harm to oneself or to others, 
then you can continue such a bodily action. Okay, now paragraph 11 is the way to reflect upon an action that has been completed. So after you have done an action with the body, then you reflect upon that action thus, did the action that I did with the body lead to my own affliction, to the harm of others, to the harm of both? Was it an unwholesome action with painful consequences, painful results? Okay, if you see that that action did lead to one's harm or to the harm of others, then, here the Buddha is speaking in a monastic context, he says, then you should confess such a bodily action, reveal it, and lay it open or expose it to the teacher or to your wise companions in the holy life. So this is a process that the Buddha laid down for monks and nuns who have committed unwholesome actions that go against actions against the precepts. In order to be cleared of them, one confesses them to another monk, to another nun. Okay, having confessed it and so forth, then you should undertake restraint for the future. So you confess the action in order to clear oneself of the transgression, and then one makes a determination to restrain oneself in the future. Okay, but after committing that action, when you reflect back on it, if you see that it wasn't harmful in any way, then you can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states. Okay, the next paragraph repeats the same thing regarding actions of speech. But the next few paragraphs just repeat the same thing for actions of speech. Then 15 repeats the same thing for actions of mind, except that there is a difference. I think I pointed that out in the note. I should have had it in the text in note 639. The difference is that in the case of mind, since it's a purely mental action, not something which is done bodily or verbally, one doesn't confess it to for the monk or nun, one doesn't confess it to another monk or nun. But rather, one should feel repelled humiliated, maybe that's not a good word, repelled, ashamed, and disgusted by that mental action. And having done that, then one sets up restraint over the mind in the future. So in an action, that when it's a purely thought or emotion that one is feeling, if you have to confess every unwholesome thought or emotion, <laughs> It could be that you go on confessing over and over and it just becomes an annoyance for oneself or others. But instead one sets up a sense of shame or a sense of repugnance towards the unwholesome thought and then exercises restraint over one's thoughts in the future. Okay, then paragraph 18 is a kind of summation or declaration about this process of reflection a broadening or ex extension of it. The Buddha says, whatever recluses and Brahmins in the past purified their bodily action, verbal action, and mental action, all did so by repeatedly reflecting in this way. Whatever recluses and Brahmins in the future will, will purify their bodily action, verbal action, mental action. They will all do so by reflecting thus, and whatever recluses and Brahmins at present are purifying their bodily, verbal, mental action, they are all doing so by repeatedly reflecting thus. And therefore you should train thus, who will purify our bodily action, verbal action, and mental action by repeatedly reflecting upon them. 
And what or at least a few practical ways to go about this process of reflection, you know, to apply it in your daily life. And that is, in the course of the day, if you do anything that you consider to be wrong or unwholesome by body or by speech, especially by body or speech, then at the end of the day you review your behavior and just make a mental note of that unwise bodily action, unwise verbal action, and make a determination to refrain from it in the future. If it's something really heavy that weighs on your mind, then you can, if you have like a fellow Dhamma practitioner, then you can speak about it with them in order to get the weight of it off your mind. But if it's just matters that are a bit, that others would consider trifling, but that are upsetting you or disturbing you, what you can do if you do like an evening devotional service, or just go before a Buddha statue in your home shrine, and you could do a confession of this before the Buddha, saying, Bhante, I have committed this. Not, not this Bhante, but Bhante the Buddha. <laughs> but, uh, Lord Buddha, I have committed such and such unwholesome actions. Please, of course we don't have the Buddha forgiving like a god, but please accept my repentance for this and I determine that I'll refrain in the future. Twelve Hail Marys. Excuse me? Twelve Hail Marys. Now you don't get to Say it again. Twelve Hail Marys. Twelve, I say twelve Hail Marys. <laughs> Please, yeah. So, uh, it seems... Yeah, take, take, take the uh, microphone. It seems like in this uh, latter day of reflection, uh, we had a chronogram of the Nazi uh, yeah. case. It, it's, it's been kind of answered in this way of reflecting. Oh, so that's, that's a good point, yeah. yeah. It was a tag. You, you are not really mind, you are looking at the consequences. Uh, that's, yeah, that's a very, very good way to put it, yeah. Because in, yeah, in this process of reflection, you're really examining what are the, what the consequences of an action that I'm going to take when I'm caught in this dilemma. Any questions now? Okay. Go away. You take the, the microphone. And is it true that in the home chaos of uh, the absence of unwholesomeness is the wholesomeness itself. Because you say, if I don't do something badly uh, bad mm. to others, mm. to myself or to both, yeah. then I could abide, abide in happiness and the wholesome state. So uh, it's a passive wholesomeness. I don't, I don't think so. It's just that in you know, the Indian way of expressing things, there's a kind of fondness for using the, the negation of things that are considered bad or unwholesome in order to suggest what could also be positively good. Like the three roots of the wholesome are aloba, adosa, amoha, which is literally translated non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. But those also imply positive qualities like non-greed can apply generosity or giving to others. Non-hatred will imply patience, loving-kindness, compassion. Non-delusion implies wisdom, insight, understanding. In your practice, there is a gap uh, for a person who is engaging, engaging in saving lives, for example, for whales, or a person who stays at uh, home with whales, like the, the big whales in the ocean, somebody has to take actions to save them. Oh, I see, yeah. Engage, yeah. It's kind of yeah. actually put into action. Yeah. Well, I would say, that, you know, that there are many other 
suttas or teachings of the Buddha which speak about different types of positive wholesome action. So, what are they? Excuse me? What are those sutras? Well, the ones that speak about giving, well, morality is explained often as abstaining from this, abstaining from that, but developing like loving kind, the four Brahma Viharas, the four divine abodes, and practicing patience. And those just mentally you know, contemplation? Well, I think they also, they'll also be expressed in action. Okay, I have an internet question or two. Actually, it looks like the second one is... Almost it's just already answered. I think you just already answered this. But this is a continuation of this. Yeah, it seems that it's almost the same one. Answered. Would it be correct to say that wholesome in Buddhism is defined as anything that is not unwholesome, and the unwholesome is anything that has greed, ill will, and delusion as the intention. So wholesome must be free from greed, ill will, and ignorance. I mean, that much is true, but it doesn't mean that, <laughs> that just sort of sitting in a state of passive, um, passive quiescence is itself you know, the fulfillment of the wholesome. In the first question here, what about the issues with moral absolutism versus moral relativism? Where does Buddhism stand versus Catholic and Muslims? I think the question is a little bit beyond my scope right, ability to answer. Okay, I think we'll have to stop now and break for the lunch period. Then we'll come back for the lunch. And after our discussion, I'm going to need some people to help to put away all of the tables and to reset the meditation cushions here. Because there's going to be meditation retreat starting tonight. Okay, so we'll end with the sh sharing of the merits. Sharing the merits is something wholesome, no? <laughs> In fact, there are ten bases of meritorious action that are spoken about. Giving, moral observance, cultivation, development, meditation, service or helpfulness to others, showing respect and reverence to others, listening to the Dhamma, teaching the Dhamma, sharing merits with others, rejoicing in the merits of others, and straightening out one's views or understanding. So those are ten positive actions. Okay, so let us share the merits with the Devas, the Buddhas or fierce, fierce spirits, the Nagas, the dragon spirits, and with all beings. Akasa taj bumata deva naga medhika punyanta nanamo dipa chiran rakantu sasanam Akasa taj bumata deva naga medhika punyanta nanamo dipa chiran rakantu desanam Akasa taj bumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyanta Nanamo Dipa Chiram Rakantu Mankaram <coughs> Eta Patacham Hehi Sampadam Punya Sampadam Do it the short way Sabe Deva Namo Dandu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Sabe Buddha Namo Dandu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Sabe Sada Namo Dandu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Bhavadu Padaya Vichyeta To Etantare Satakayupapanna 
Yeah, I we said, have discussion. Did, didn't I say? That yeah, you yeah. come back after we lunch. Yeah. Come back after lunch. It's discussion today. And, and then after the, after the discussion, then we have to bring all of the tables. We bring the table up to the discussion. And um, bring them in the back and then set up the meditation cushion. Come back for discussion after lunch. Uh, MN061 and then series 